uh, has anybody been here before? Raise your hand if you've been here before. So a lot of newcomers, that's really awesome. Um, and thank you so much for coming out on this really gross, rainy uh, evening. Um, so LMHQ stands for Lower Manhattan Headquarters. We are run by the Downtown Alliance, which is the business improvement district for Lower Manhattan. Lower Manhattan is really growing. It's expanding with creative businesses. We're no longer just the financial district, uh, but we have um, advertising, tech, media, information, fashion, um, and hybrid industries, industries that are moving to the 21st century, like FinTech. Um, we do public programming here about three or four times a month um, with leaders in the industry talking about um, disruptions in the industry, how the industry is moving forward, uh, the future of the industry. And we are just so excited to be talking about humanizing data tonight um, with um, this amazing all-female panel um, of kick-ass fintech uh, industry leaders. Um, we're just really so excited to have future perfect ventures and uh, Jala Jobin Putra. Joan Putra, uh, say that three times fast, um, with us this evening to kick off the panel. So without further ado, Jala. Yes. Well, thanks um, all for being here. This is uh, great to see so many faces. Um, and, and thank you for uh, these wonderful ladies who I've, I've worked with and admired and who are true uh, leaders in the data um, and fintech spaces. So uh, Future Perfect Ventures, uh, quickly, is uh, an early stage fund that I founded here in New York uh, three years ago. I've been a venture capitalist since 99, um, started out in Silicon Valley, and uh, invested uh, throughout the world in, in FinTech. Uh, that, that whole time, I was one of the first investors in Yodley, uh Financial Engines, uh, which is both I IPO'd uh, since. Uh, before that, I was an investment maker uh, in New York and London in, in the tax sector, um, and about uh, half of my portfolio companies are in, in tech, um, and, uh, and a lot of blockchain and data analytics and machine learning space. So I would love uh, you guys to introduce yourselves and, and what your company does, and then we'll get into the, the conversation. Okay. Can you jump in? Yes. Uh, so I'm Jane Barrett, I'm founder and CEO of Goldbeam. Um, we are an investing for beginners platform, and based on the insight that uh, you know the wealth management industry is called wealthy, and for the vast majority of people who would like to just get better at their money and get started investing, it's very hard to know where to start. And I'm thrilled to be talking on a data panel because data really is at the core of our business. And if you just think about you as a, as much as I hate the word consumer, right? You make portfolio decisions every day before you spend your money. And you generate enormous wealth for many, many companies and many shareholders of those companies. And unless you're participating in the economy as an investor, that's a one-way flow of money for your whole life. So Goldbean, sorry to press one bit. Um, <laughs> so Goldbean is a platform that's, you know, we're an education-first advisor. We are a fiduciary standard advisor, so we have to act in your best interest versus just, you know, milking you for fees as many companies do. And uh, yes, I'm thrilled to be here and talking data. Um, so I'm Hilary Mason, I'm the founder and CEO of Fast Forward Labs. Um, Fast Forward Labs is uh, almost two and a half years old, and we are an applied machine learning research company. And what that means is we essentially do two things. So we do our own program of applied research, and I started my career as a computer science professor, and most of the folks I work with are, like me, we call ourselves reformed academics, and so people who started down a science path um, all the way, in some cases, into the tenure track, um, but then decided they really like to build things. Um, and so would rather be in a, a space where things move quickly, um, you can actually sort of see the impact of your work immediately in the real world. Um, so we have our own program of research, and the types of things we investigate are emerging algorithms or techniques that are just becoming possible today. And so to give you some concrete examples, we've explored things like natural language generation systems, which are systems for generating narrative from structured data, so automating generation of articles um, or weather reports or um, one of our finance clients is using it to automate their um, compliance filings. So, you know, there's a finance example. Um, other things we've looked at are deep learning algorithms for analyzing rich media, so images and audio. Um, we're working at the moment on probabilistic programming, which is simplifying the use of Bayesian inference. So, 
the sales pitch for that used to be you can be Nate Silver in five lines of code, except nobody wants to be Nate Silver. <laughs> so we thought we'd figure out a better story for it. But, um, but, but it's essentially simplifying inference and prediction and making it something that you, we've been able to do for 30 years, but it's become so easy that you can play with it and you don't need a stats PhD to do it. So that's one side of what we do. The other side of our business is that we have an advisory service where we work with a number of clients um, to sort of help them understand their machine learning data strategy roadmap, um, what algorithm to use for what problem, uh, what's possible with their data. Um, and so on that side, I usually say, like, we're their nerd friends. So they're like, they want to do some things, they want to build some products, they want to know how to improve certain products or solve problems, and we help them with that. Um, and that's what we do. Hello, my name is Shonda Brown. I run a business development company called SoFi. SoFi stands for Social Finance, and we're an online lender that is revolutionizing, first of all, the student loan space. It's a $1.3 trillion crisis in America. I'm sure you've heard about it a lot in the election campaign, which I won't bring up right now. Um, but uh, we're looking to be able to find better financial solutions for specifically millennials. I hate the word millennial because it tells people how they should think. So I use the word early career professional. Um, and that's just basically people who are, the word Henry, and that's high earners but not rich yet, who have been basically ignored by the banking systems previously that are, are quite traditional in the way they've looked at, at financing. So we're looking at creating a relationship throughout the life of an individual to be able to supply the best financial solutions to achieve those life goals throughout their, their career. Um, as our CEO likes to, to call it, um, he wants to be the meteor by which all the dinosaurs uh, of the banks become extinct. So we're coming up against uh, some of the big banks and looking to be able to, to help uh, in a greater way. So we've helped 200,000 uh, of our members uh, help them refinance $13 billion of student loans, um, mortgages, um, a, a wealth advisory tool, most recently personal loans, and also insurance products. And you guys are one of the most respected and highly valued fintech companies out there. And, um, and I think that social mission plus the, um, uh, the knowledge of the, and the domain expertise in the space is, is a fantastic combination. Um, so on, on that note, uh, how, how do you think that data has impacted the financial services sector? And What's changed in the last couple of years? I mean, as you guys have, have, have grown and we can start on the Yeah, great, great question. And so when I look at what data has impacted on the financial scene, uh, a lot of that isn't relevant today. We're completely different people in the 21st century than they, we were um, in the past 50 years. So the data points that we've been looking at specifically don't apply to what our forward earning potential is. So if you take the case of underwriting, um, so SoFi does online lending. Uh, it, when you look at FICO, for example, that's a backward look at what you've been doing in the past. It doesn't Im impact what you are going to be doing in the future. So what SoFi has done is, is totally revolutionize that and take a look at, at FICO, not altogether. We've eliminated FICO from our underwriting criteria, which is different than what any other uh, lender has done. So we take a look at the earning potential of someone by basically their, their free cash flow. So we take a look at what their income is, minus all the expenses, where you've lived, and take that data point and find a much more efficient way to look at what you will be doing in the future and how we can support that. You know, if you if you have a degree, if you've worked hard, if you've graduated and now you're earning income, you're much less credit risk than when you were 18 years old and perhaps took out a student loan, for example. And so you're much less likely to default if you have this, this criteria that you need to fulfill than if you uh, hadn't graduated, for example. So we take a lot of different data points to be able to create that. And as a result, we've only had uh, about 15 defaults out of 200,000 um, loans that have been out there. And unfortunately, half of those have been due to untimely death. Uh, so, so our underwriting criteria is pretty good. And I'll be talking about a lot of the different ways that we humanize that um, later on to be able to support on a greater scale. Yeah, and I mean, for us, on a macro level, data's being set free in a way, right? So you, your financial data used to belong to banks, and they would judge you, and they would cross-sell you, and they would segment you, and you know, I, I come from the marketing world, and 
for many, many years, data just existed to sell you more stuff, right? And now with account aggregation tools, you can get access to all of your data. So if you wanted to, and you were Hillary, for example, you could build your own models and algorithms to do the sort of predictive things. But you know, there's amazing tools out there that let you very quickly get access to your own data and turning the world inside out and bringing value to people based on them sharing their data. And I think it's both a watch out and an opportunity. You know, if you're sharing your data and you're getting services for free, you can be pretty sure that someone's selling your data, right? You are of value either as lead generation or as input into algorithms, for example. But if you're getting value back from that data, it's teaching you something, it's showing you something, it's enabling you to fulfill a goal, like, that's amazing. Like that, even like five years ago, that was your, you're on your own with some Excel people. I, I think that's the key right now is, is you know, how, how do we let people stay out work for them? And those are the companies that I think ultimately are going to win in this uh, new landscape. Hillary, so you work across a lot of different sectors. And so I'd love to hear your perspective on how you, you see data babies and fintech and where you see the, the change over the last few years. It's definitely been a big change, and um, the change is um, one that is driven by a number of factors. And one is the technical capability. Um, like we can do more for less money with the data. The second is the emergence of capabilities that we just didn't have at all before. And so these are things like being able to take a photograph and algorithmically tell you there's a puppy and a can of Pepsi in the photo. You just could not do that five years ago. Now you can do it, right? Um, and so in the, specifically in the finance side of the world, um, what we see are a lot of companies that are sort of realizing they have a data opportunity, perhaps for the first time, because they've run their business for some time. And these are banks, insurance companies, um, folks who have been collecting data almost as a side effect of some existing business process that they've been engaging in. And now they're saying, OK, we have this resource. Um, you know, is it actually useful for anything? And so there are a couple of things that it might be useful for. Um, generally, a lot of these companies also have a lot of, um, they want to innovate, but it's very difficult to do so in a larger environment. And so they look to folks like these two to, to actually build interesting stuff. Um, but what happens is that you need to be able to make an argument internally for value generated from the use of the data before you can do something that has never existed before. So the first thing you need to do is to save money or create money by applying that data to easing some process um, or automating some small piece of work or making uh, some outcome that people care about higher quality. So we see things like like the risk compliance um, filings is actually a fantastic example. So, you know, we do a, a fair amount of work in this language and narrative generation, which means you take structured data and you create language that represents the structured data. And if you've heard about this, um, it's probably been because there are reporters running around being like, oh my gosh, computer scientists want to replace us with programs, that is not true, because it can only ever generate language that is substantially like language that has existed before. So again, to give you a really short example, we built a system that writes automated real estate advertisements. Um, so you give it the number of bedrooms, bathrooms, location for New York City, um, and it writes the ads. We'll say like, the sun-filled home is your family's like new place, convenient to the park, whatever. And you can ask it to generate types of documents that have never existed. So like you can ask for a nine bedroom, one bathroom apartment. Um, and it will write you a beautiful description that is a little weird because that doesn't really exist. So now we have this one bank generating their um, compliance documents. These are large reports they have to send to the federal government every year. I was giving a talk a couple weeks ago at an event and sort of mentioned this offhandedly as one example. Um, and a guy came up to me afterwards and said, I work at FINRA and you know, we're using NLP, so natural language processing, to understand these documents as they come in because they're so big and unwieldy. So now we live in a world today where a program is generating the document, a program is reading the document, and a human on either end is doing something else. Um, and this is, I mean, I think it's hilarious, but it's also, uh, it's just sort of step one of where we might be going. And so the, the other applications we're seeing are things like um, 
long language generation, we're generating things like celebrity news and things that are really, really funny, but that's not in finance. Um, well, well, we can get to that in a little bit um, because yeah. there's been a debate with the election. Oh my gosh, that the election. <laughs> so that's a whole other story. <laughs> right, I'll stop. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's actually a great segue into um, how much is too much data, and, and so this is a this is a question I grapple with a lot as an investor too, because I mean you know you hear about all that's possible now uh, with the algorithms and software um, and faster processing, um, and and yet um, you know, I think humans are still very important in in this process. And so I'd love to hear your perspectives, too, on uh, where you, your companies fall on the spectrum and, and what you found, of, you know, utilizing the data and, 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 you know, how important you think humans are versus the algorithm. Uh, so with SoFi, we think that humans are the foundation of what we're looking to accomplish and, and work with them on a long-term relationship. Uh, which said an article in the New York Times last week that explains how uh, SoFi is working to actually create that fulfilled relationship throughout the life of that relationship. So starting with a student loan, which being the entry point, because it is the, the largest financial transaction that someone's had up to that point. I mean, the average person graduates with $37,000 of, of student loan debt from undergraduate. If you're going to law school, it's closer to $150,000. I just helped someone refinance a loan that had $850,000 of debt. So if that makes you feel any better about where you're at. They were an oral surgeon. So I, I still, like, if, you, if you're, you need to earn a lot of money to be able to, to make an ROI on, the, on a student loan like that. But the point being that, that it's the human at the end of this. And so by being able to create that relationship with someone and build that trust, you're able to help them with a lot of other uh, the, the tools that, that you can provide to them because you have that trust at the beginning, I've given them a good experience, and they continue on with other services with once you have that information about them. And so as a lender, you, you know where they live, you know what their income is, you know what their preferences are. And so what SoFi has done is been able to create an entire member experience around that. So part of that is creating uh, member events. So we've thrown 400 events this year um, if you are a member, you're, you're invited to those. We throw happy hours every week in New York, um, all across the country. We've taken um, people skydiving, single skydiving over um, uh, Valentine's Day. We have a dating app now. There are three people. Um, one person's actually engaged, um, and we're paying for their wedding that have met every single event. <laughs> no, it's just, it's natural. Like, you come to these events, um, and you're, you're, like-minded individuals, you're, you're highly educated, um, you have careers, and you're meeting other people that are interested in the similar things. So you're connecting naturally, and that's why you're able to, to make, make those connections. And thankfully, a lot of those have been romantic. So, so we're looking to be able to create that humanistic approach um, with that, that data that we create. Um, so part of that is also career services. Um, so the number one reason that someone wouldn't be able to pay back their loan is because they lost their job. So what SoFi is able to do is pause their loan and help them find a new job through our networks. So we have job boards and you know, with the companies that we work with, Apple and Google, we place people through those relationships and connect people organically um, to be able to help support them. We do career advising, so they're having relationships with our team of career advisors. Um, and we always make sure that even though we're completely online, you can go through the process uh, and never speak to a human. We have uh, 400 people on staff that are employed by SoFi that are our call center to talk them through the process um, and have that real human connection so that you feel like you are connected to a company and a brand um, that isn't just this online automated factor. I mean, if you're looking at the largest financial transaction you have, our, our average loan is $75,000, you kind of want to talk to someone and make sure that this is a real thing and not some entity out there that, that doesn't really exist. How do you differentiate between something that's online and, and a real person that you actually trust and want to continue that relationship with? So I think that having that humanistic approach and showing that you that you are something that is trustworthy is, is critical and very important. That's those are fascinating stories. And it makes you think of you know what, what banking used to be, which is community banking, and people would go in and, and talk to, to the bankers and the tellers and, and, and really build a relationship with them. 
the FICO score was less important because um, there was that relationship. And then along the way, we went through to these large banks. Uh, we went to um, more automation and, and cutting as much cost out of the system. And, and now it seems like we're moving back to you know, some equilibrium. Um, exactly. And, and you know, with banks, I, I don't know about you, but I probably would not go to a happy hour step by my bank. Um, so that's how we're able to really differentiate ourselves as a lender that you actually want to be able to work with. Yeah, I mean, we have two sort of different points of view around this one, which is when we first started building the gold reading platform, we had enormous amounts of data input. So again, as a fiduciary, we have to go through what's called KYC. Now your client, give me all these data points. Finra's like, no, I don't know, but, but Finra <laughs> says we have to do. And what we found was we would get on the phone with people, and what we've got from a compliance perspective is nowhere near a complete enough picture to figure out where someone is, because they may self-report lower income, higher debt, which often is the other way around, but they may have a pension coming or inheritance coming, or they've got you know several different layers of debt they haven't talked about. <laughs> so we've had to, you know, to be compliant, really look at what is a base level advice for the regular person. We had to do a lot of natural language around, you know, you're doing great, Sean, you know, congratulations on building a base of, you know, X savings and what we recommend you do is why. And um, the data that we put in to get the output, so it's all of different company performance, different fund performances, to be able to get a portfolio recommendation. And we were looking at things like social media sentiment. So it's like the input from the person, what's the world saying, and then what is being reported to the SEC, and how do we build something that is compelling out of that. And the data set that we threw away fastest was the social media sentiment. Because logically, you know, if someone's talking about a product, a brand, a company, it leads to revenue, revenue leads to growth. And we found it was just noise. And I, I would like to be corrected, but I haven't found yeah, that noise. happens to everyone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think where it gets really interesting is, you know, we partner with banks, and we actually partner with community banks, credit unions, more mission-driven. Um, and I am actually very hopeful for the future in that there's been, a, there, as you say, been this sort of shift back to, you know, I want a broader experience versus I've showed up and I've showed my FICO score and now I'm going to get cross-sold, you know, every different loan product under the face of the sun and occasionally people buy them, clearly. So um, I think having a a view of data which is not necessarily at this moment in time, and Chandra referenced this, it's like there is only so much you can tell from your history, but understand where someone is at that moment and where they're likely to go. And so let's take them on a journey that is part, and it's always going to be product sales, but also part educational and part empowerment. And I think that's where I believe the big winners of the future will go. Can I speak to this question from a very different perspective? So, so these are both perspectives that give you sort of the up close your data and what one product does. If any of you are undecided about your future career goals, I would love for you to look at being a user experience designer for data and machine learning. Because a lot of this is figuring out the line between how people experience an algorithm and when a human needs to step in. And I can give you a couple of examples that are, are sort of lighthearted. So one is, um, I think it was in Oklahoma, these two twin 16-year-old girls go to the DMV to get their driver's permits. And the first one gets her permit, and the second one is rejected from the system because that person is already in the system and it says it's fraud. Right. And now, okay, that's funny, right? So whoever programmed that didn't think, oh, there are identical twins who dress alike and actually look so much alike that the, the system's going to flag it. Why didn't a DMV employee override it? And it turns out, of course, there's no override. Um, so now you get into, like, a terrible, like, criminally bad design of software where you're putting a data system in place where a human being can look at it and say, this is wrong and this is ridiculous, but someone has made the decision um, that that's not what should happen. And so, so when we think about building automated systems, um, and something we do at Password Labs is we write about the ethics and, and likelihood for things to go awry of every algorithm we discuss and every system we discuss and how people really should think through those spaces where it can go wrong and you need to have human judgment available and some kind of 
either override or ability to throw out the results of the automation um, in order to give a better experience. And it's funny when you think about these poor girls who had to wait a couple weeks for the second one to get her permit, like, ah, uh -uh, whatever. There was also a really good story of them, one of those automated passport photo machines in New York that takes your photo, and uh, this bald reporter went in to get his photo taken, and it cut off half his head because they never, like, practiced it on bald people at all. Um, and, like, yeah, that, that's really funny. And they just couldn't make it work, and he couldn't get his photo, and he was really frustrated, and all these other people are getting their photos. And he's like, well, why? <laughs> Why would this be funny? Um, because you're bald. I mean, right? Um, and that's, I mean, it's funny, but these are things that when you put these systems in places, um, like dealing with someone's financial data and the ability they have to get a loan, or in, in a criminal justice context where they can go really wrong and they can be incredibly damaging. So that's something that if you're looking for your, a place to have an impact in this space, that's one where we need people to be thinking about it and developing expertise because it doesn't exist right now. And, and I would say, I mean, we're, we're talking about FinTech, but healthcare, I mean, if you look at um, clinical trials, most of the input has been around you know, middle-aged men, no. and it's uh, really impacted the drugs and the dosages that have gotten developed. And, and I look at AI and machine learning and, and any new technology and fintech platforms is absolutely essential to have diversity and the development of, of um, I, I, I would say the technology as well as the business models and, and um, from a societal standpoint as well as from a financial standpoint and, and making sure that you're capturing all of the value that's out there and I, I would argue that we have it in, in, in the past. Um, and, and so on that point, um, and I don't think this was on my list of original questions, um, I mean, do you see, and, and the reason, one of the reasons I'm bringing this up, too, is I was at a dinner of uh, BCs last night, and of course I was the only female at that, the dinner, uh, but when we started talking about gender differences in some of the companies, um, and, and, and the companies' uh, applications that they invested in, and, and so not the management teams. Uh, have you guys seen any differences in demographics and gender as, as you look at your uh, customer bases? Um, yeah. I mean, we, we set out to serve women, millennials, and minorities. Basically, everyone but middle aged white people. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> John! Um, but there was, I mean, something pretty amazing happened in that even because we almost over-designed for a female experience without making it specifically for women, and there is so much anxiety around money, which men also feel, that we ended up with a 50-50 split between men and women. You know, it's the average age is 29, the average deposit is $4,200. So it's, you know, it's absolutely, you know, these are fresh new investors, the exact people who are so, um, we see some amazing gender differences in terms of we get a lot more um, people coming into the fund that are women and a lot higher conversion rates with men. So I think there's still a lot more tentativeness around um, the usage of the platform. But for the way that we started the business and what we're seeing, you know, we're, we're thrilled. We're, the thesis is proved. Okay. Uh, so for, for an educational standpoint, we're seeing uh, quite even rates between men and women, um, between different segments. Uh, I mean, men tend to have much more engineering degrees and technical degrees than women, um, and tend to have higher student loan debt, uh, but everyone that has a student loan uh, is, is able to, to use the platform, and we're seeing about 50-50 um, across the board. And, and Hillary, we've talked a lot about this over the years. Yeah, and I have, a, I have a particularly biased perspective because um, from where I sit, there are tons of women building machine yeah. learning systems, yes. but that's maybe because we like to talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I, I do really want to second that it is important to have multiple voices in the room, especially when you think about the way systems um, can go wrong, but that even sounds extreme, just the way people are likely to want to use products and the concerns people will have about how those products might impact their lives, especially when it's making certain data about them public. So if you guys could, women could 
wave a magic wand <laughs> and 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 um, you know create new technology, data, uh, market uh, related to your business. What what would you do? I can answer. Yeah. Yeah. So I would create a banished bullshit wand. And <laughs> it would get rid of, I mean, the whole, uh, uh, you know, hype around AI, which is um, very scary to me as somebody, like I'm an optimist and I see a ton of potential in, um, in these techniques and in this practice, but that you have people running around saying like, you know, we're going to have the AI is doing these things, which are just really not even possible. Um, like, actually not possible. Um, you know, it's very, it concerns me a lot, and I think that it sets up people's expectations in a way that is going to lead to a lot of disappointment. Um, so yeah, just the vantage bullshit. Plus the fake news, you can just yes. get rid of that. <laughs> and, and so, if I'm going to jump in there, um, well, I mean, what... And you, you don't have to answer, but I mean, do you have an opinion on on, on the you know, this view that fake news impacted the election? I, mean, I, I didn't realize it was so pervasive until these reports came out. Yeah, I, so I haven't given it enough thought, so I'm going to ask for all of your forbearance on saying something that I haven't fully thought through, and I'll share that. And for four years, I was the chief scientist at Bitly, which is a social media analytics company. So we spent a lot of time looking at data about how people share content on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, many other platforms, email. Um, and I do think it definitely had an impact. Um, I don't see a way in which it could not. Um, and that really, really concerns me as a, a citizen and somebody who, there's also no easy technical solution to this. Right? And that was my next question. Yeah. I mean, yeah, as a data scientist, um, what, what's your view on how long it would take, or is there a solution? So, I mean, you can think about it similarly to the spam filtering problem, right? So we all use spam filters in our email most of the time without even noticing, and they've gotten really, really good. Um, and so you could imagine a similar type of system, and what those filters do are they're just statistical classifiers where for every new message or new item, they, they return a probability of that item being spam based on items in the past that have been spam. Um, and so, so the touchy point here is in that notion of having a probabilistic idea of truth, right? So what is the probability something is true, and where do you draw that line? So yes, you could build something, but we may, as like fully well-intentioned people, we may disagree on where that line should be. Um, and so it, it really becomes a very interesting, I'll say, human question, right. another user experience of machine learning question to figure out um, what that really should look like. Um, that said, it's it's up to the platforms who, um, and it's up to Facebook and Twitter and whatnot to build this, really, um, if we want it to be done pervasively and done consistently and done well. I think there's also responsibility on behalf of broader media as well. And I mean, I was in the digital media world in the early, early days when we were basically just making it up. We were making up form factors, we were making up analytics. Like, you know, what is this going to look like? And what happened very quickly was um, you can generate a lot of eyeballs. And all of a sudden, the money went to, you know, from, let's say, print dollars to digital dimes, and now it's like a little bit digital dimes, but like fractions of pennies. Like, the amount of clicks and views it takes to make any real money, and yet the advertisers still put money in there. So there's, there's accountability all the way through the economic chain. It's not just... You know, it's easy to say it's Facebook and Twitter because they were huge contributors, but there are a lot of content farms out there because the advertisers need the eyeballs to be able to get conversions. It used to take a hundred dollars to get one conversion, and now you know it's significant. So, and that's why it's important to build businesses that are based on other things, like <laughs> which is what you guys are, are, are really true. doing. So, what's your magic wand? So my magic one, I mean, the world of sort of B2C and B2B is a very passive world for everyone sitting here. It's like you are just going to be muffled to one way or another. And I think your data is very valuable and it's being sold every day, thousands of times a day. And in my ideal world, it's a C2B world. Like I'm flying my family of five to Australia. Why the hell aren't those airlines pitching me? 
why do I have to do all the damn work? Right? Give me your best price. And I mean, there's kind of platforms out there, but there are intermediaries. Everyone, again, everybody's getting paid. My data is being sold because I can't raise as someone who's going to spend a bunch of money to go to Australia. And yet, I'm still the one that has to cough up all the money. So I would love to see a world where the person who owns the data gets to share the data for their own benefit. Great point. And, and just to build on Jane's point, that as far as a, a B2B and B2C goes, um, so if I started as a consumer-based uh, product, so I would go online and, and get that product, what we found through looking at the data is that uh, a lot of consumers get their information from their employer. And so we started building a channel to filter that information through the employer. And so that's the division that I run is, is so if I work, where we would actually provide financial benefits, financial solutions through the employer to share with their employees as a financial wellness tool. And so we partner with companies like Apple, Google, Facebook, General Motors to be able to offer a student loan repayment program through the employer. So if you work at Apple, they're, they're actually going to pay for your student loans as a benefit. Um, so that's been huge and I think that's going to be a standard in benefits going forward. I mean, just today there was an article in uh, Times to be able to to say that that is the hottest new benefit coming forward. Um, so as part of that, um, some of the regulatory things that I would change, it would all be about um, the political impact that we're having right now. Um, so uh, so guys put a bill through the House and the Senate to be able to make those contributions right now that an employer is paying for their employees tax exempt. So that the employee wouldn't pay taxes on that and that the employer wouldn't pay taxes on that. It's just like a 401k. So Johnson & Johnson was the first company to make 401k contributions, and those were taxed as well, um, until they went through and said, we're going to pay this, um, we need to be able to make this much more efficient, because it's important to be able to have a retirement savings account. And, and now that student loans have become a $1.3 trillion crisis in America, it's just as fundamental to, to that issue of that financial wellness. It's the first time that people haven't been able to start businesses, they haven't been able to buy houses, buy cars, they're delaying having families. Um, getting married because of student loan debt, and that just shouldn't be an issue. Um, so employers can help out by being able to contribute, but they aren't going to do that if it's a disadvantage, if they're taxed for that. They want to find an efficient way to make those payments. So um, we were in a very steady stream to be able to have that tax exempt, um, and it got really good feedback from the House and the Senate, um, but we'll just have to see what, what happens. So um, I really wish I could have a magic wand right now. <laughs> Wow, that's a, a lot of food for thought here. <laughs> so I'm going to open it up to questions now. Um, I mean, we can keep going, but I want to make sure we address questions. Um, so since you've gathered so much data, uh, it's okay, I don't need the mic. I, I can, I'll project my voice. It's okay, we have a Facebook Live call. Oh, no problem. Uh, so since you uh, collect so much data on your customers, do you think you know your customers better than they know themselves? <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> No. <laughs> I think humans are nuanced, and like what you're reporting in your data today, everything will all change tomorrow. And um, like I said, even having conversations with clients, you start to get a broader picture and fill in. And I think as a you know a broad take up for us, the need to be able to continue to aggregate that picture to be able to give better recommendations in the future is incredibly <coughs> important. But not if it's at the you know the risk of invading someone's privacy. You know, like everyone knows those horror stories of you know the, the parents find out their daughter's pregnant because you know, target sent for mailer. Right? <laughs> so there's uh, there's a lot that you can learn from humans, but it's still watching the behaviour and talking to them and getting their report. It's still under you. So I don't think it's that uh, that a company would know better. Um, I just think that there's a lot of insights that we can derive from that data and knowing what we know and being an expert in that space and having the insights that that you know you are overpaying on this. We know from this this data right now that, that you're being underpaid in your position. So you know what? You should probably ask for a raise. And here's how to do that. And those are the programs that, that we're able to provide to you, uh, not only for something that's specific and a, a financial tool, but also saying, you know what, uh, you're at this point, you just bought a house, you should probably think about life insurance, and these are the reasons why. Um, and it's just looking at data of saying, hey, statistically, this makes sense. And it's amazing how 
people don't do things that they know are good for them. We all know that we should sleep eight hours, that we should exercise, and, and at what point is that a priority on your scale? And so by saying that, that there's easy ways to remove those obstacles of, that are the prohibiting people from actually moving forward with what is good for them, that's where we're able to make a difference and make it easy for people to, to do the things that are, at least in, in my case, financially uh, the best solutions for them. To add really quickly, it's a very um, common misperception that data that's useful in the aggregate is also useful on the individual level. So you can learn a lot um, from looking at population scale data. And so like the FICO score, which we've been hating on all night, is a great example of something that is actually useful over the entire set of people who have a score. The averages are useful, but your specific scores are probably not that useful. SAT scores are the same way, right? Um, and so, so that's another uh, area where you can think about the, the data does not necessarily say anything about you as an individual, um, but in aggregate, it can tell an interesting story. Well, thank you so much. That was a really, really awesome answer. Thank you so much. Good question. Thank you so much for sharing everything. A uh, quick question. Um, what's your view on the trends and opportunities in the fintech space in general? I know there's a lot of these companies coming in uh, 2014, 2015, but some people already started talking about fintech as a mature space. So I wanted to uh, just get your guidance on some unique opportunities. I know we already covered a little bit, but um, the trends out that we're not seeing here. So the money's not going away. I mean, it's, it, it might be in different forms, and I think fintech will always have a role in sort of modernizing how people deal with their money. But just even looking outside of fintech and technology generally, it's very easy to do, you know, this year is the year of chatbots in fintech. Last year was blockchain. You know, the year before was robots. And there's always, and it's saying like industry makers, it's the year of social, it's the year of search. There's always, going to be new trends and for investors it's very difficult because you've barely digested like two years ago because it takes so long to do the deals and trying to keep up with what's next. Um, well, that's our job. That's the job. job. <laughs> it's, it's actually. <laughs> but having a, um, that's true. That's yeah. true. Yeah. But having a view of data as something that underpins all of the trends and being very data literate, it is um, something that's shocking to me and any other people in Fantech, but sort of, that's just something that backroom does. It's like, well, no, that's kind of everything. So yeah, I, did, I would say the more consistent trend is data. I, I um, so I, I think we're just in the early days of, of, of Fantech. And when I started investing in 1999, and I actually had a, a you know, what would now be called a fintech startup in 1997 here in New York. Um, it, was, it wasn't called fintech. It was, um, uh, you know, we were starting to automate um, uh, some investment decisions and information and, and um, you know, you know, started off, I mean, they're now one of the largest financial API companies um, in, in the world. They started off as a consumer site for a single uh, password login. Which you know did evolve. They they got a lot of interest from banks uh, as customers, and then they they morphed into uh, being a fintech provider. So um, you know, for me, I look at broader trends of what's happening you know uh, in, in the world. And if you look at um, and, and we have great examples of this on, on, on the panel. But if you look at what SoFi is doing, I mean, it's it's not just a fintech company. I mean, they are partnering with their customers uh, throughout their life cycle, um, uh, offering you know to all sorts of services to them. And so, finance is an underpinning of, of um, personal finance. Uh, is such an underpinning um, for for a person's life, and, and that's not going away. Um, and, and that's why I think it's it's really exciting to be investing in the sector. And I don't really pay attention to media articles, so, you know, if, if I did, then I would Finance, uh, how do you just balance 
applying the knowledge in the financial industry and the technology, how do you set up your priority? Which one do you think is more important or in the long term, do you think that which, like how many percent that you want to generate some just uh, your knowledge or your experience in this way? Which one you would recommend for the young generation? Is that uh, just give us some experience or what you thought about this? So I actually think this may be the question where we finally really disagree. <laughs> so that would be great. Um, because, you know, one thing I found in my company, and again, I'm a computer scientist, I don't have a degree in finance or um, everything I've learned about it has been through the process of working on some project that taught me a lot. Um, and so I thought initially we'd end up sort of in one industry or another industry. Maybe it would be media because I have some experience there, and you know maybe it would even be healthcare. Who knows? Uh, it turns out the thing that spans all industries is data and the use of technology. And so from my point of view, I'd say if you can master that technology, then you will have plenty of opportunity in finance or anything else, whatever happens to come after fintech or whatever we call it in ten more years. But I expect both of you to disagree with me. So. Um, I'm not going to violently disagree, <laughs> but I think you know we do have a debt crisis in this country and in many countries now. Um, banking issues can't be solved by traditional bankers. It needs a fresh view, and it's not just tech. You know, you actually need new strategies. You need new ways of engaging your customer experience, and you know more people coming into financial services that think differently outside of what has always been just product led. You're a retail bank, you're a wealth manager, you're an investment bank. Like it's, it's been so compartmentalized for so long that I would love to see a new generation of um, people that can come in and think differently about a customer experience and a product set that is much more in line with a long-term view of financial health versus a short-term view of I'm going to get paid my fee today. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and I also, I don't mean to let you answer, but I also, I mean, if you look at what's happening around the world, I think the U.S. is so far behind in, in a lot of um, the way they approach financial services because we have these legacy infrastructures and, and a regulatory environment that's been more challenging post 2008. Um, I mean, one of the reasons I was late is because I forgot my wallet in the office, and uh, so all I had was Uber. I couldn't take yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't take the subway. <laughs> I was stuck in traffic for uh, for a long time, and you know, to me, it's it's just crazy that I couldn't use my phone to get on the subway and, and you know get get somewhere. And, and and so and so you know that's so different in so many places around the world. So um, so I do think we're. I mean, I think thinking of finance traditionally, um, or at least in the segments we have, that's starting to break down in the U.S. But we've seen it. The world. Yeah, and just discussing that regulatory landscape, I think that fintech is going to continue to grow, and it's just at the beginning stages, and so we're going to see a lot more regulation involved with that. I mean, I'm seeing that with the Department of Business all the time, where they're, they're really starting to crack down, and we're starting to have to change our patterns of how we conduct business. That's only going to be able to increase as our business increases as well. Um, but talking about the, the difference between technology and finance, I don't think that those are separate topics. I think those go hand in hand, and that those are necessary in order to even move forward. You need to have that base of the finance of, of that just makes sense in order to be profitable, in order to continue to offer the best products that you can to the consumers, to the members that, of, that you serve. Um, but you need to be able to make it easy. And, and by removing those obstacles and making it easy for people to use, you need to be able to utilize technology. And so by being able to have a technical aspect that, that is, is simple um, and, and quick, efficient, um, that's the only way you're going to be able to reach more people and be able to, to make it something that is, is commonplace knowledge, um, as well as being able to have the fundamental values of, of having the, the capital markets or the securitizations um, in, in order to be able to actually have that cash flow that you continue out to, to move forward. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's a two-part question here. So given that uh, all this talk about uh, election data keeps coming up, uh, one is 
and also the issue of Russian and tampering election system with voting machines. So how would you go about ensuring regarding ATEM, whether voting or anything, that integrity? And the second part is where do you feel emerging technology like blockchain and other protocols could uh, play a role in that, ensuring that that integrity? We should take a blockchain. Oh, well, yeah, so I, I'm a, I was one of the first investors in the blockchain space, so I'm very biased um, in terms of being a big believer in, uh, in, in the infrastructure and being able to you know, protect our data um, by uh, putting it on this immutable ledger um, and then also giving us our own private keys to that data that we can then permission <coughs> to unlock uh, to other parties. So, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of proof of concepts around blockchain. Um, I'm actually starting to see some really great uh, cybersecurity applications of, of blockchain. Um, you know, I think we're in like 1995 internet days um, with, with blockchain, so we're, we're definitely going to see these cycles. Um, but, um, I mean, more than ever, and I started investing in the space four years ago, um, I believe more than ever that uh, it's going to be part of our, our uh, security infrastructure uh, down the road. But do you want to talk about security? Uh, not really, I don't think it, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is, uh, security is becoming um, more and more, again, if you don't have your career sorted out, security is another great area to yeah, become an expert in. Yeah. Um, because we are just starting to realize the mess we created over the last 10 years in putting a lot of systems online that uh, you know security was not the first or even the second priority. Um, we've been talking about the trends in the industry, like um, blockchains and personal finance and, and maybe healthcare and national language processes, but I'll, I want to ask a question on a personal level, because um, for a person, it's kind of, it's, I understand it's kind of easy to keep up with the trend. On a personal level, it's just hard to make career choices, right, because like, you know, you land a job somewhere and then you're just going to stay there for like, what, 10 months at least? And then just leave for <laughs> us? It's just like, there's so many things going on in this in this world. Like suddenly, this year, blockchains and last year, I don't know, like personal finance. And on a personal level, like, how did you, how did you like, make the such career decisions? So and how did you involved yeah, in this industry? And yeah. how did you like, with so many things going on, how did you, that decide what you what you want to do and okay. So the question is, you know, with everything, all the trends that are changing all the time, you know, how do you decide what to focus on? Um, I never, you know, follow trends. I think you have to find out, you know, what you're passionate about first and foremost. Uh, I didn't even know what venture capital was when I was in college. Um, I knew I, I I was interested in in the internet in its commercial form was not around yet. Um, so, uh, but I knew I was interested in communications, development, uh, connectivity. Um, I was an English major, you know, 20 plus years later on the venture capitalist focusing on highly technical areas. But I followed what I was interested in and, and um, you know, when I was investing in blockchain, um, it was very hard for me to raise my funds <laughs> because people thought it was crazy. And, and so I think if you're just uh, reacting you're, you're never going to kind of even end up being in the thick of, of what's next. I think it's important to read and, and inform yourself, but combine that with what gets you excited, form your own opinions. And, and you know, like you said, 10 months, it, it's nothing is, you can always morph and change and learn, right? It's not, it, just because you choose one path doesn't mean you're stuck in it forever, especially now more than ever. <laughs> We have time for one more. Okay. So, uh, great talk. Um, I, I'm from an insurance background, so uh, insurance tech is obviously taking off. Um, and I also build machine um, core models or AI, or whatever it's called nowadays, in, in that space. And uh, what I'm really interested in is uh, your view on, we've talked about a lot of the successes. Uh, like you to touch on a few of the failures as well, uh, and, and especially the failures, the specific failures that could come 
from the difference in expectations uh, for what AI is supposed to be able to do and what it actually does. And that would be interesting. So that's a very specific question, but just generally. I mean, I, I think I'll, I can speak to that because by the time people find me, sometimes they found me because of those failures. Um, and so I spend a lot of time, and my whole team does, um, making sure that we can explain everything to anyone. So if people come out and they're like, yeah, this AI system is, you know, um, playing Go, we can tell you how that works in a way that you will understand. And, you know, when people ask me, you know, how do I know if this is real or bullshit? I say, well, can they explain it to you? And if not, it's probably bullshit. Um, and so we spend a lot of time sort of helping people um, think through just logically, you know, we have this data, we can learn this thing from this data, the system works this way, this is how it all, it all function. And this is actually um, something that I think is a bit unique because not everyone in the machine learning space is equally comfortable writing English as I was, I also <laughs> studied English. Well, that's the, the human part, right? right? <laughs> as they are writing code and doing mathematics. Um, but in order to actually see good work get done, you have to be able to do both. And the, the fashion we have in our space of sort of acting like we're super cool because we do something that's mathematically complex, like that's also bullshit. It's not that hard. Um, and if you can't explain it to somebody, that's a problem. Um, that said, I also think that this field is sort of a space where most of what you do fails, and when it works, you're really, really happy. And so I can tell you many examples of things we've tried to build that seemed like good ideas at the time but didn't work. Um, some, some of them turned out to work later on, um, or someone else got them to work, which is always a really sort of annoying feeling. But um, <laughs> you know, the, that's sort of the practice of the work. It's not like you, know, you just push the buttons and magic comes out the other side. It's a lot of, you know, I like to use the example like MacGyver and stuff together, but nobody who's younger than me knows that is anymore, so it's like trying to figure out all the pieces that you can put into the puzzle to get to the result that you want, and there's a lot of failure along the way. So one thing that I have found is that no one really knows what they're doing. We're all just doing our best and figuring out, using common sense and using data to be able to figure out that this, this seems like this would work. Let's go ahead and try it and see if it does. And that's how we're able to create something that's totally different. And if you fall on your face and you learn from that and be able to move on to the next thing and be able to tweak in a in small way. So we've done that even at SoFi and that's why we are the, the leading FinTech company. So um, keep trying, keep making mistakes and learning from that. It's, it's the risk that, that builds that reward. Well, I feel really fortunate to have been part of this conversation. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.